When I did my piece called 10 Freedom Summer, it's a collection, well, the recorded version is 19 compositions, okay? It exists over three collections, but in fact, the whole collection is 26 compositions. And it's played generally over three nights, can be played over two, two days, which it has been done. It's about the civil rights movement, okay? And it's not exactly about the civil rights movement, but I say that so that you can kind of get a, a drift of where I might go. It's about the effect of the civil rights movement on America, but the psychological effect that it had on America, okay? Um, so, so each of my pieces in that 26 piece collection, they have what I call uh, signatures or markers, okay? Signatures or markers. Like for example, the first piece that was written was uh, Mega Evers out of Mississippi. And I don't know if you know his story or not, but I'm gonna give you a little glimpse of his story. Not right now, and if I forget, somebody remind me. But Mega Evers was the first piece that I wrote in that collection. And it was done in 1977. And it was done at the request of uh, Leroy Jenkins. Leroy Jenkins was a great friend of mine, and every time he put together a new ensemble, he would always call me and say, he called me Smitty, you know, I didn't like it, you know. <laughs> I didn't like it, but I didn't care, you know, it was Leroy Jenkins, he said, hey, Smitty, um, um, I got a new ensemble, can you write a piece for me? And I, and I would do it. Uh, the first one, or the second one, I don't know which one was first, but one of them I wrote called Manhattan Psychers. They recorded that. Okay, um, so this new piece that he wanted from me had uh, Andrew Sorrell, Anthony Davis, and Leroy Jenkins in the ensemble. And so I, I wrote the piece, and it was about Mega Evers, because I'm from Mississippi, and I wanted to do something that had a little bit of a um, delta touch to it, okay? Um, but the piece is very abstract. It has nothing to do with the idea of blues or whatever, whatever. It's a, it's a very abstract piece. But what I'm trying to tell you is that uh, I wrote the piece about Mega Evers because he was killed minutes after JFK, that's John Fitzgerald Kennedy, gave the first public uh, uh, story or narrative about race in this country. He's the first president to ever do that, okay? And the narrative that he gave was not in his text. It was, it, was an, it was an improvisation. He improvised the last five minutes of his speech. It's on YouTube. Go there and look for it, okay? And that, from that speech, the mean-spirited people in Mississippi decided that they would send a message. And the message that they wanted to send involved Mega Evers. Mega Evers was a very successful African-American man in, in uh, one of them places in Mississippi. I don't remember the name. He drives home, driving to his parking lot, get out of his car. His wife and son is in the doorway to greet him. And as he turned out of the door, he's shot in the back. And he falls dead on the ground. Okay. That's what that piece is about that Mega Evers piece that I wrote, it's a, the, the even itself is probably less than 10 seconds, okay? But my exploring the psychological dimension of that act is about 17 to 18 minutes long, okay? And the marker in there is that particular event. And the way I show it, uh, there's a, there's, a, there's a visual aspect to, of it in the score. It's not a capsule, somebody shot laying on the ground. It's just that there are circles, overlapping circles, with, with figures of F, Ds, and D sharps, and E sharps, and so on, inside of there, okay? And the other marker is, is that when the, it's, it's a piece for, for a small ensemble, and when Golden Quartet enters with the small ensemble, that's the other marker. That, that marks that event. Okay, and it proceeds from there to the end. Okay, um, um, those particular markers, no one would ever know it but me. 
you see. But the fact is that all of you know it now. You know what that market is, okay? And that makes a difference because normally when that, when that performance of 10 Freedom Summer is given, I always talk afterwards because my purpose, one of the purpose of making that work, I didn't start out to make it like it was, but to make it, how it came out was to provoke a conversation about race because everybody's afraid of race. You know, it's, it's, you should be afraid of it. It's, it's not a real thing. It's not a real thing. If you look historically back, the idea of people being classified by race happened in the 1800s. You can go back and look it up. In the 1800s, before then, Jack came from Louisville and Betty came from uh, Little Rock and so on and so on. That's how they identified people. They didn't identify them by their race, you see. And at the inception of that was also the philosophical idea about race, okay? So, so race is an artificial marker. But you have to talk about it because everybody thinks it's real, you know? Everybody thinks that, oh, uh, she's, German, or he's Tibetan, or whatever. The fact is, is that it's just a human being. Just a human being. With no other qualifications except that that human being breathe and live. That's what makes a human being. Not intelligence, not how tall you are, you know. Just a human being. No complicated issue at all until, until you step to go into the realms of power, then, you, then it becomes something. That's when it matters. But uh, if you know that you're a free human being, the blockage that is, don't want you to come in, don't want you to do this, it don't hurt you because you're already free. Bob Marley said it clearly, you're talking about my freedom, which means that nobody can give you freedom, you see? Nobody can. So, so my, my, my idea of trying to communicate uh, is to try to touch some of these issues that everybody talks about but not out loud or openly. Another one, another model. Let's take JFK because we started with him. Um, I was in the Army when JFK was killed. Okay? I was in, in my barracks. It was my barracks, U.S. barracks, but I'm in this room where I and all these other men sleep, you know, because in the army you all sleep in rows and then these just so and so. And I, also I had no rank, no power, so I'm, I'm in a bunk bed. I'm sitting on a bunk bed playing my trumpet. My friend comes in and says, uh, Kennedy has been killed, assassinated, okay? And so I jump up, this is a true story. I jump up and I run to what we call the day room in, in all these places, they got these rooms where they have television and this and that. They call it, in the army in those days, they call it the day room. You would go and sit and watch. So I ran over to see, to see the TV, to see what was actually happening. And when I stepped inside the building, my warrant officer, because people that, that conduct and run bands in the army, they're called warrant officers, okay? My warrant officer, my first sergeant, and his first mate, and a couple other mates, they were dancing for joy. They were, they were, they were actually celebrating that, that, that he had been killed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, they were happy, okay? I was in Louisiana. Also, that's another good marker too. I was in Louisiana when this happened. And so I knew immediately that, wow, I better get out of here. <laughs> No, no, literally, I better get out of here. And I did. I went and asked for transfer. 
I didn't tell them why, because if I told them why, they'd have kept me there. You know, out of spite. Okay? But, so, so, I think about that for many years. Then, I think his anniversary was 50 years uh, last year, right? Huh? Year before. Yeah. Um, so, so when I, when I wrote JFK, uh, the, what is it, JFK, the Space Age, something, something, something. I can't remember exactly the title, but it's a long title. Okay. Um, I didn't want to make a piece that I'm going to think about his whole three and a half years as president and stuff like that. I want to make a piece that would show something that I could capture, okay? And what I decided that I could capture was, and what I actually decided to capture was the fact of his body moving from the rotunda in, in uh, D.C. and where all those dignitaries, 125 of them were walking behind the casket that was driven by these these horses or mules or whatever the hell they were. And I want to capture just that image right there, okay? And within the frame of the television, because I saw it on television. I wasn't in D.C. I saw it on television. So, so my, my JFK is about just those, I would say, minute, minute and a half where this image shows the casket the dig so-called dignitaries walking behind it. And everybody was there, including Haley Selassie, by the way. Um, uh, it's a fantastic scene to see. So I decided I would make my piece about that. Okay. Not about his presidency, but about just that moment. And um, um, uh, that's, that's what I decided to do. And because of the notion of, um, of tonality, and you don't have to know what tonality means. Tonality simply means a resting spot, okay? Let's say it like that. If you're doing some other kind of sounds, then there's a spot where something rests, okay? Well, in JFK, uh, I have the temperature going boom, beam, which means JFK, okay? And that temperature is sounding the tonic, okay? That is the resting spot. Okay, but the strings, they are not on the resting spot and it ends like that, just like that. And normally you don't end a piece, at least let's say it this way, if there are some tone references, some reference to tonality, you don't end it like that. But I ended it like that because I wanted that, just that frame to go and stop as if it kind of passed by the stream, okay? Every piece is like that, every piece. Um, i give you one last one and then I wanna take some questions because you gotta have questions. This is the last one. Uh, what's the other president's name? Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, a curious story. During my research, I found out that in 1957, Dwight Davis Eisenhower introduced a civil rights bill. Did you know that? I didn't know it either until I started doing my research. He introduced a civil rights bill, and Lyndon Bain Johnson, who was the head of the Senate, I mean, uh, the House at the time, majority whip, he went around and got everybody to vote against it. Everybody voted against it. So it failed. This is 1957. It failed. Okay? Now, Kennedy gets assassinated, and he becomes president. He renamed the New Frontier to the Great Society because he didn't have no image at all about what to do. So he just took that, that whole program that Kennedy had and renamed it the Great Society, okay? And of course, he signed the 1964 uh, Civil Rights Voting Rights Act, right? 1964. LBJ has, in the last two pages, the signature, my signature, which is, from, from, from that last section to the very last sound, horizontally there are 64 notes, 
okay? And vertically, from the piano and the violin with a harmonic, and the lowest position in the piano, it's the interval over 64. That's at the end of it, okay? That's my marker, okay? And I can tell you, you can ask anybody on earth about a 64th interval, and they'll have no idea about it, because they don't think like that. The reason I don't think like that, because the largest interval that people deal with in music today is a 13th. You never heard anybody say a 16th or 17th or, or 29th or 67 or 142. You never hear them say that. The reason they don't say that is because they're not dealing with that. But a 64th interval is a striking, marvelous something to hear. And you can hear it. All you have to do is listen to, to, to uh, uh, whatever that guy's name. Um, who was I talking about? LBJ. LBJ. Uh, just listen to the piece. It's right there. You would not mistake it for any other interval in the piece because it's the very last interval. Now, that's how I condition each piece. And the reason I told you that, because I think it's not important for me as an artist to make a piece simply because I feel it's a good idea to make a piece. That doesn't exist for me. That doesn't exist. I don't want to make a piece just because I can make it. Okay. I want to make a piece of music. I want to make it because I find the meaning, the need, and the urge to make that something become part of my reality. And then the second part of it is to have it become some part of somebody else's reality. That's the reason for me to make a piece, okay? But every piece that I make, and they'll, I don't want to tell you how many pieces I got, but I got a lot, I'll tell you that. Um, every piece has its own Pacific research. Every piece, okay? And by research, that means a lot. That means like you find out about what it is that you're gonna be exploring. You find out what kind of instrumentation is gonna fit or attract, be attractive for that something. And you find out how to select this concoction of just 12 notes to make it represent that. And then when you finish, you allow it to exist on its own without your own Bother it. You don't have to bother it ever again. Just let it exist. And if people love it, which is also a strange word, or if people hate it, which is also a strange word, if people accept it, which is a strange word, word if people reject it, which is strange. Why am I saying that? Because if you have heard or seen or been involved or witnessed or experienced a work of art, you don't have a choice. There's no choice about hating it or liking it or, or whatever because it's part of your psyche for the rest of your life, and it would never be erased, never. It's already part of you, so why, how can you hate something that you can't get rid of? And you cannot get rid of it, I tell you that for a fact. <laughs>